Okay, happy Halloween. Welcome back to System Software. Glad to see so many people here. I guess the Halloween parties are later, I guess. Okay, so project three was uh, assigned last Tuesday. We went over all the control flow stuff the last couple of weeks. Does anybody have questions on project three? Yeah. How we should have the wildfire because in the, the, the project three information itself, it doesn't actually show an example of what that would look like. Oh, okay. Uh, I think the slides. Oh, you mean an example, like a complete example? Well, it has the kind of template in here for the while loop. Is this sufficient? Yeah? Go ahead. So it's like label two is just put up there, and then uh, we have we have to compare it going on, and then we make the, the actual uh, branch thing, right? And then just jump back to label two. Okay. Yeah. So the the label two, the, the the you can think of this as the head label that goes before you emit the expression. So that way you can go back and recompute the expression. When we have uh, like a, uh, an if and else statement, uh, mm -hmm. do we need to have uh, a line that says so to uh, that essentially says so to jump to or uh, uh, to another line so that we can skip the else or something like that? Yeah, this is this is the if then else statement. So we've got our LLVM branch, and depending on whether the condition is true or false, we either jump to the first label or jump to the second label. That represents the if body here. And the else body here. Okay, so we do need that dr label label five in there. Yes, that that will make sure. Yeah, exactly. So you don't. So if in case of the if, and say it's true, and you run the if body, you don't want to run the else body. Okay, so without that line, it would just jump to the very next line of code. Regardless. Yep, exactly. So that's represented by this flow chart. You can think of those two bodies that I just showed you, label three and label four. So this is like label three and label four, and both of them jump to this label five. Okay. So that's like a diagrammatic representation of this exact control flow. Yeah. Do you need the global inventory for like the label name? Yeah. How are we supposed to go back You can just, you don't have to have, you can have one counter for all of your temporaries. So you can say T1 and then label two then label four, and then temporary five. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's like you just need a unique ID generator. And a simple way to do it is to just increment a counter. You could even just use the same, you don't even have to say label three. You could just say T3 here, T4. But then when you say you generate T3, T4, then you go back down to T1, and then you But where do I go back down to T3? Label three right there. Here? Oh, so if we look at the pseudocode, you generate the labels once, and then you use them twice. You use them when you emit the branch, and you use them when you emit the label. So you just generate them once. Just turn, yeah. Yeah. So I came up with an idea for the, the labels. Um, you can do a, an if label one, and then else label one, yeah. and then end. One. Yeah, you could totally do that. You only have to increment your variable once, and you have all three of your labels. Yeah, you could do that. So what your classmate is suggesting, instead of generating the labels first, you first just increment the counter before this, and say, okay, now I'm on now I'm on counter three. So just you concatenate that with if if label, else label, end label. That'll make the code a little more readable. Um, yeah. So it's just really up to your, your up to your, up to your choice. If you want the code to be readable, this is also going to be read by a machine and turned into machine code. So it's you know it's debatable how readable it needs to be. But yeah, any of these schemes work as long as it's a unique ID, you're good to go. Other questions on on project three? Last time I promise to go over an example. I kind of was rushing at the end and the audio actually cut out, so it kind of worked out. I just clipped it off of the of the last the last lecture. My battery was dying. So today, uh, as promised, let's start with 
doing code generation for this nested, uh, this if then else statement nested inside of while loop. So let me get this board here. Okay, so what we had was a while loop. Uh, let, me, let me make this look like it's a token. So we have a while loop. The while loop has an expression inside of its parentheses. And it has a statement, which I will, for reasons that will become later, put down here. All right, the nested statement is an if statement. So let me put the, let me put that if statement here. So it's an if followed by an expression. Then we need the if body and the else body. So I'm just trying to uh, allocate this space properly so that when we fill this in, it will be possible to fill it in with all the generated code that we have. OK. Any questions on this on this tree? Does it look right compared to our our demo code? <clears throat> so I left out the stuff that was before the while loop, and I just put the while loop itself. I left out the parentheses and the curly brace uh, curly braces. I sort of simplified it a little bit, uh, and also left out the details of the nested the nested statements and expressions. So I've just kind of abstracted all that away so that we just have the while statement with its nested if then else statement. Questions? All good? All right. So let's set about uh, generating code for this. So just as a reminder, this is the code generation for our while loop. So we consume the while loop, the while keyword, and the lpren. Then we generate a new label and emit that emit that label immediately because we want to have a label on the um, expression computation so we can jump back to that and recompute the uh, while loops condition. So the first thing we do is here, we emit, we generate the new label and emit it. So more or less, that's what the, the output is gonna look like. Of course, you know, you have to generate a new unique name but okay, so we generate a label called head. So remember, this is a this is a post again. This is a post order traversal of the tree, which means we start at the the statement head. We see the while, and the next thing we do, in according to our pseudocode, is generate and emit the head label. The next step is um, recursively calling the expression to generate whatever that code is going to be generated. I'm not going to show that here. That's like project. Project two and project or yeah project two, the generating expression. So we assume that this expression has been generated. Make sense? Make sense? So let me um, maybe I should write the uh, write the actual code down here. So the head gets produced and then this is like whatever expression produces. Let me just uh, and the expression was. X does not equal zero. So that's just going to be the code that gets generated for expression not equal zero. So that will, so what is, uh, what is the expression code generator return? Yeah, it returns a new temporary register. So let's say it returns T1. So now statement knows that the, um, that it, uh, yeah, that the value is that the value is t one. Okay, that's this condition 
here, where we save the register that holds the condition. The next thing we do is we generate labels for the body and the end, and then we generate our branch. So our branch statement uses the condition register returned by the expression code generator. So the code generator for the expression tells us what register we're using to test for our branch. And it generates the, uh, the rest of the instruction, which jumps to either the body label or the end label. So notice here at this point in our code generation, we don't actually know yet what the, what the statement is. All we know is that we have two labels that we know we're going to jump to in the future. Because you know, we're generating this code. We know that there's going to be these two labels because we're going we're gonna to make that. We're going to write that code. OK, so the next thing that happens is we emit the branch statement. So this is our branch emission. The code for that looks like this. So we branch on T1 either to label body or label end. And as before, you have to generate unique labels, unique labels for this. OK, the next thing that we need to do is emit the body label. If you notice on this tree here, the, the very next thing is the statement, which is you know whatever that statement is, however much nesting there is, however complicated it is, that's going to be the body of our while loop. Uh, so we first emit the label for the body. And if we go down to our emitted code, that's what this looks like. OK, so what's next? We've emitted the label for the head, emitted the expression computation, and emitted our branch and emitted a label for the body of the, uh, oops, this should be body. It emitted a label for the body of the while loop. So what's next? What's the next element or the next node in our post-order traversal here? Yeah, the if statement. This, this statement is the next node that we look at. So we recursively call the statement function to start generating whatever, whatever the code that we need for that statement um, for the body of our while loop. OK, so now we sort of, because you know, this is how recursion works, we, we freeze the state of the, this top level statement and finish generating code for this nested statement. And once we come back, we'll finish up the while loop. So we are now here inside of our while statement code generation. Once this statement is done, we can emit the rest of this, you know, emit the the unconditional branch and the rest of the labels. But at this point, we just need to recursively generate whatever this statement's code should be. And we set it up so that the label, you know, that, that code, whatever it's generated, is being labeled by this body label. All right, with me so far? Questions on this so far? All right, so we see that we have this nested if statement. So the first thing, oh, so let's go to our, let's go to our if then else code generation. The first thing we do is we consume the tokens and then generate code for the expression. What does the expression return when we generate code for it? Just like before, it generates, yeah, it generates a new temporary variable for us. So let's say that happens to be T2. Of course, it probably it's going to generate a lot of other temporaries, but you know, for the sake of this, let's just say it generates T2. You want to switch back to screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, generates T2. Sorry about that. OK. So the next thing we need to do is create the labels for the if body, the else body, and the end. That is reflected in this flow chart. We need to generate labels for this if body here, for the else body, and for the end, so that we can, we can jump to them later. Once we have all those labels, we can start generating our branch statement. So just like for the while loop, we generate our branch. 
And that branch, well, so here's our, here's our condition. Forgot to put that in. Condition is y mod two equals zero. So we generate the condition y mod two equals zero. And I'm just going to uh, use the rest of the space here to keep generating code. Okay, so that's our condition and we generate our branch statement. So we branch on T2. I forgot to put the type, but that's okay. And, oh, sorry, thank you. Sorry, yeah, I have, I have two devices going on here. So this is our if label and our else label. Okay, so there's our branch statement. What's the next thing we need to do? Close, we do need to go to statement, but we need to have the label so we can branch the statement. So this is just the way LLVM works. The branch, conditional branch always has two labels. So even though it is the next statement in the, you know, if you're writing this in Intel, the branch would only have one label. So you'd either not branch or branch, but LLVM makes the control flow graph a little more explicit. So we generate the label. So we emit our if label. And here is our if label in our code. And now we can generate whatever the statement generates. So this is just whatever the statement happens to be. We generate the code for that. And I'm obviously gonna run out of space here. So emit whatever the statement is. All right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing we generate? After we, so we have the label for our if body. We emit the, the body of the if, the statement. Then what do we need to do? Right, we need to branch. We need to do an unconditional branch to the end, which is actually not in the pseudocode. So yeah, right, we need to branch to the end. Okay, so we emit our branch to the end label. So there's our branch to the end label. Yeah, I'm definitely running out of space. Uh, and similarly, we emit the label for the else branch. So there's our else label. Then just recursively emit statement. And again, emit the branch to the end. So our branch to end happens after the, the statement. And then finally, we emit the end label. So we emit this end label. Okay. Okay. And then once we, uh, so now we're finished emitting this if then else statement. And once we reach, we return to finishing up this while loop. So let's take a look at our pseudocode. We left off here generating the statement. So the next thing we need to do is emit this unconditional branch. So, so we're back in the while loop. We we've, we've, can ignore whatever statement just generated. Doesn't really matter what was generated there. We know that whatever code was generated, the next thing we have to do is do our unconditional jump back to the head of the while loop so we can recompute the condition. So we emit our unconditional branch to the head. And finally, we need a label, which is the target of our branch for when the unconditional branch is, I'm sorry, for when the condition, <clears throat> for when the condition is false, we need to uh, have a label for our, so I'll call it NW 
for end of while. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. So we need to emit our unconditional branch to the head and then emit our label for the end, which is the target of our, of our branch from the while loop. Okay, questions on this? Questions on this? Yeah. Uh, at the bottom here? Yeah. 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 So do you want me to write out the whole like LLVM code? Or is this is this okay? Yeah, I just wanted to know why it was saying it was kind of hard to see the R. Oh yeah, sorry, my I have fairly bad handwriting. So. And over there, it's it's body and semicolon. Yeah. 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 What what does it say after that body semicolon? This is oh this is the um. This is the expression. The I'm sorry, and this is not the expression. This is the uh, this is the condition of the if statement. So maybe I, I don't know what it says. So I can sh shall I? Um, so I can sort of map this code to the parse tree. Would you like to see that mapping the code to the parse tree? Okay. All right. Let's do that. So let me, so give me one second to, to write this out. So I'm just going to write out the LLVM code and show how it like maps to each piece of the parse tree. So now I have to do this from memory. So we have the head of the while loop. We have the head of the while loop. We compute, what was it? I have a terrible memory. X not equals zero. So there's going to be some expression there and a branch on T1 either to the body or the end of the while. The body label is our nested if statement. The nested if statement first, uh, so this is, uh, let's see how I can describe this. Well, this is the, uh, what was it? Y mod two equals zero. So this is from the if statement. And then we need a branch to the if body or the else body. Let's see what's next. We have the if body next, whatever its context contents are, I don't really care. Yeah, it's just print Y. Unconditional branch to the end of the if, the else body, is also a print statement, but it's printing y times two, has its own unconditional branch to the end if. The end if, so that's the last thing that gets generated in this nested if then else statement, returning us back to the while loop. So let me actually put this over here. Okay, so now we are back in the while loop and the while loop has an unconditional branch to the head of the while loop. And finally, we've got the label for the end of the while loop. Okay, did I miss anything? Does that look, does that look correct, more or less? So let's see if I can tie this to our parse tree. Let me use another color here. Okay, so our parse tree had a statement at the top. 
that statement parsed a while loop. Oh, wait a minute. This is backwards. Sorry. There's a good reason why it should be on the left, as you should see in a second. So we had a statement as the top level thing. That was a while loop. OK, so let's see how this is. This is going to look a little bit, hopefully not too ugly. So that while statement generated this head loop, I mean this head label. You with me so far on this? And has a nested expression. That nested expression generated whatever was after this head label. I didn't. I didn't do. I didn't do the full uh, code generation. But whatever code generation is just going to be plugged in there because you're just printing all this out sequentially. So as long as you just recursively call expression, it'll emit its emit its generated code. And then the statement, the while statement produces this branch. Let me do something real quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, the while statement generates this branch. Let me do something real quick so I can show this in another way later. Okay, the next thing after the expression, we generated the branch and the body label. So now we come to our nested statement, our nested if statement. So our nested if statement saw the if keyword and gener uh, saw the if keyword and then matched the expression, the conditional expression. That generates whatever this code is. So it looks like it's part of the body of the while loop, but we really just recursively called statement, and it just emits whatever it, it, it wants to emit for, for an if statement. With me so far? Any questions on this? Questions so far? OK, so the next thing in this statement is generating the branch. So the if statement generates this branch and the label for the body. The next thing that gets recognized is the statement, the actual like body of the if statement. And we just recursively call statement to generate whatever, whatever code is going to be generated by that statement. We don't know what it is. We don't care what it is at this at this level of the grammar. Once we've generated that, we can generate the end branch as well as the next label for the else statement. So the end branch and the label. Then we've got another nested statement here that generates this code. And finally, our statement, even though this looks, oh, I'm running out of space generates the end of the if, uh, the unconditional branch to the end of the if, as well as the end if label. So now the nested if statement is done. And we return to uh, generating code for the while loop. And all it has to do is generate this unconditional branch to the head and the final while, uh, end while label. So questions on this so far? Questions on this? Another way to look at this is that we've got, well, let's see if I can pull this off. So all this code right here was generated for the if statement. while all of this code is our while statement.
You see that? And underneath the while statement, we had a little, I mean, it'll be larger when you do the full code generation, but this little snippet here is our nested expression for the while statement. This snippet here is the expression nested under the if then else statement. This line is the nested statement under the if then else statement for the if body. And this is the nested statement for the else body. So unfortunately on the left, it's actually the tree is like mirrored, but I think, think that sort of shows the idea. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And this is actually why you can, um, you can do decompilation and kind of reverse engineering. Because even though this looks like just straight line code, if you know that the code was generated by a compiler, you know that the compiler you had this structure originally in your code. So you can actually kind of infer what the original source code may have looked like, part of it at least, some of its control structure. Okay, hopefully that's, hopefully that's a little more helpful. That, does that make sense? Any, any questions? Any questions? Good? Yeah. Um, this is more for the file input, but will we be, will we be guaranteed like it will be if then space expression or could it be like if expression with no space? I think it could be if expression with no space. Okay. Yeah. I think even in, oh wait, can you do that in C? I was thinking, wondering if, if you have no space after if, but I don't remember. You don't have no space. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay, questions? Questions on this? All right. Yeah. Wish my handwriting were a little better, but this has been my lifelong struggle. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's, that's control flow. And hopefully you can off, go, go off and finish project three. I think it's once you have all the like understanding of the tree and all the recursion and generating code, it's actually not too bad because you're really just offloading all the work onto your existing statement and expression code generators. You're just making little templates that uh, you plug in your, the rest of your statements and expressions into. Okay, no more questions, anything else? Okay. So today's topic is functions. And once we get to project four, which is your final project, which I'm sure you're very sad about, so there's plenty of bonus exercises you could do. I've even update, I've been updating the list of them. I know how much you're clamoring for more programming work to do. So there's a, there's a bunch more, uh, where are they? Yeah, I've added some other ones related to functions. So like checking for unreachable code, making sure that each path has a return statement. Uh, so maybe I should actually show a little bit the, the uh, grammar for this. So it's just like what you'd expect in C. Uh, actually, maybe it's easier to see an example. So here's a very simple example of functions in simple C. Looks just like C in this case. You have your um, type, name, parenthesized list of parameters. Parameters are comma delimited, compound statement, and just a list of declarations and statements. It's a little simpler than what current C allows in that just like the top level program, you have to put all your declarations at the top of the, of the if statement. But we'll go over more of the, the source language um, uh, next time. Today, I just kind of want to go over the function abstract, abstraction itself, how it's actually implemented in hardware. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go more over the, uh, the source language and processing it next time. Okay, so the main, well, so I've given you a little hint here, but can anyone tell me what they like? Anyone want to kind of define what a function in programming languages is? Like, what is it to you? What is a function? Because I was thinking about this. And I don't really have a good definition. So, yeah. I feel like, okay, uh, if, if I'm the main, I'm like hiring someone to be like, hey, this is your job, and you just give, return me this output. That's, That's good. What I'm expecting. So it's like a servant. Yeah, it's like a servant. Okay. 
it's just, yeah, you're sort of off, you're outsourcing computation yeah. to something else. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's a, a way of prioritizing the, the work that has to be done in a, a way that uh, um, allows for a, a, a smooth flow. Because when, when I first started to learn the code, I was learning on my calculator, and I didn't know how to uh, do, I didn't even know functions existed. Oh, yeah, and yeah. what I found was that the programs would get really slow if I didn't have a, uh, a certain part of it that just did its own little thing instead of trying to do everything all at once. So this is, yeah, this is like, you know, instead of top-down programming, you have, like, modularity. You can chunk up your computation into to separate pieces and you can sort of organize it better. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I, I see PMF specifically as a way to avoid having to write the exact same chunk of code multiple yeah. times. Yeah, so reusability, yeah. Or to just reduce the amount of clutter that can go on in one single code. Sure, like yeah. So like factoring out common Common computation, yeah, all really good answers. Yeah, you guys have a really good intuitive sense of this. That's really good. So I, you know, I was looking in Wikipedia and thinking about the like formal world. So I think one way to kind of describe what functions are is that they abstract away computation. That's like kind of a kind of an academic way to say it. To see what I mean, let's take some examples that are like maybe not uh, maybe not computer related. So keys and locks, for instance. So does anybody here ever do like lock picking? Who's done lock picking before? Okay, a little bit. I'm reporting you. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. No, I've done lock picking as well. I think it's really fun. They do it at Hack UCF. Yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've done lock picking before too. It's, it's, it's super fun. But probably most of you don't know how the lock actually works, right? Like if you haven't done lock picking or opened up a lock, you probably don't know how it works. But who here actually uses keys and locks? Some of you don't? You're very trusting people. Okay. Uh, that's still a lock, right? That's still yeah, a lock. Yeah, but it's not one that uh, uses the standard key, so that's uh, I'm sure you're about to talk about. Well, but I, I argue that that is the same abstraction. That's the same lock abstraction. So a function abstraction is just a way to like put a black box around some implementation and just define it in terms of what it does, or maybe more specifically what its inputs are and what its outputs are. So even if you don't know how a lock works, you still know that if you put a key in and turn it, it'll unlock, right? That's its output behavior. Its output behavior is that'll unlock. And there are many ways to implement it. So you can have RFID or Bluetooth, Tumblr locks, wafer locks. And so I think the best way to describe it, and this, this, is, this is true for other abstractions in programming, is that it really just abstracts away the implementation details of computation. And the function is like one of the most fundamental ones in programming, where it's just you name your computation and you define what its inputs and what its outputs are. So another example, I thought this was kind of a funny one, is printf. So you all use printf all the time. So I think you're already convinced about the utility of functions. But if you weren't really convinced, then here's the source code for printf, which I went and looked up. And it's um, yeah, it's like several hundred lines. This is this is printf. This is what you guys are all you're getting the benefit of whatever developers labored away on that this. Just printf, or is that the entire standard I/O? No, no, that, no, that's just printf. That's just printf. I think the next function, where's the next function? Where was I? Uh, so there's where printf starts. Where is it? VF printf. That's where it starts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's doing, it's doing a lot of work for you. And where is it? End? It ends here. Yeah, it's all written in C. These are all C libraries written in C. Yeah, yeah, 300 lines with with some, you know, calls to other helper stuff. But I mean, I've never looked into the source code of this. I just did it for this just as a as a little uh, as a little example. But all of you just use this without even thinking about it. You don't even care, right? It just just is there for you, right? Some developer labored away. And that's the same idea. You just you abstract away it to a name. And we all, you know, sort of understand language. We can all kind of associate a name, the symbol of a name to something to anything to some object in the real world so that's that's really what functions give you it gives you a way to just name your computation and abstract it away um and yeah we already talked about this so you name it you define its inputs and outputs it makes it reusable um you can reason about the specification of the function instead of how it's implemented so uh, i was talking to one of your classmates today about the about the recursive descent parser 
So instead of trying to reason about all functions at the same time, you can just reason about a single function at a time. You can just say, um, let's see, did I? Oh yeah, I talked I talk to this in a second. Um, yeah, so anyway, you can, you can reason about each parsing function individually. If you define really carefully the inputs and outputs of each of your recursive descent functions, you don't have to run around your entire compiler trying to debug something. You can just say, is this function satisfying the specification that I've defined for it? So the one I recommended for you guys to use is to make a rule about the position of the file pointer whenever you call one of these parsing functions. So the rule I suggested is the callee, the function being called, assumes that the pointer in the file is right before the next, you know, the first token of that of that um, production. So if you're calling the factor, uh, if you're calling the factor production, then it should be right before the parenthesis or right before the number, the character just before it. Uh, and when it leaves, it stays on the last character of whatever it just parsed. Now this is just an arbitrary rule. You can pick whatever you want, and you don't have to follow this. But I argue that if you really um, clearly specify for each function that same behavior, you don't have to worry about the interactions between functions. You don't have to worry like, oh, what happens when I call factor with expression or factor with you know, some other function? So anyway, this is just an example that I, that I saw in office hours I wanted to sort of bring up. Uh, and that, that sort of brings to this point that when you create these functions, you know, it's, when you're hacking away, it's easy to just sort of say, oh, I want to throw this out into a function, I might call it again. But when you're doing like real software engineering and writing library code or writing code with other, with other people, you want to be really explicit about your assumptions in, in, the, in the function. Ideally, you want to cover all possible inputs to the, to the function. But even if you don't, you want to at least uh, be explicit about what the error states are. You know, in, in Java and, other, and C++ where they have exceptions, you can actually express this in the language. You can express the error states in the language. But even in C, you can make this explicit by defining what the return types are. So rather than somebody uses your library and they put in a value you didn't expect and then what, you get a seg fault or you get a buffer overrun, um, it's good practice to just cover all possible inputs to the program and document or define what all the outputs should be for all those inputs. In C especially, we have side effects. So this is one of the reasons why globals are like detested, why people say don't use globals. And one of the reasons is that uh, if, you if you're modifying global state, then the computation that a function does is not completely encapsulated in that function. So take that, that global label uh, counter that's being incremented. That, uh, the, the input to that label function and the behavior of that label function changes depending on when it's called in your program. That's kind of fine if you're really clear about it. You know, that's why I say it's okay to use global, uh, global label sometimes you know, when you're clear about it, it's kind of okay. Uh, but in general, this is what it causes. Every time you run the function, its behavior depends on some external state that it has nothing to do with its input parameters. So that's one, you know, one reason why globals are sort of like, you know, not not good practice in programming. Um, but if you do have side effects, you know, when you're doing system level programming, you're you're going to have hardware state and other side effects. At least document them. You know, make them explicit to to the person using that function. And this is just good programming in general. Be explicit about your assumptions. Okay, anyway, that's my soapbox for functions. So in simple C, they're really, really similar to C. A function has its name, you know, parameter types, return type. I think this is all pretty much pretty much review. Parameters are the inputs to the function. So if we think of a function as this black box, the parameters define the, the kinds of values that can go into this black box. And the return statement defines what the outputs are. Now, of course, in C and, and other kind of low-level programming, you have side effects. And those, um, and I think what, you know, really irks more formal uh, programming people is that this, uh, this function, if it has side effects, there's nothing in the syntax of the function that says what those are. There's no, like, formal way to know even what those side effects are. So if you're going to try to reason about somebody else's code and there's all these, like, weird uh, unclear effects that a function does, it's really, really hard to trace that program. I'm sure you've, maybe your own code, you've tried to trace your code and be like, are unclear about the state. I mean, I know I've done this. Um, yeah, so there can still be side effects. This, you know, this, this function doesn't completely describe what the effects of the function are in the syntax. But if you're taking, um, you know, Dr. Levins's Haskell class or programming languages class, Haskell does have these pure functions where there are no side effects to the functions. And there are, and if, you know, you don't have to use Haskell to do that, 
some language, some programming language will enforce that. But in C, you can just use discipline, you know, self-discipline to not have side effects. Uh, and perhaps some, some uh, analyses can help you can help you do this automatically. Okay, anyway, qu questions on this so far? Questions on, on functions, the function abstraction? So I think you're all really intuitively familiar with functions. Oh yeah, I wanted to say, I already revealed the answer. So what is the type of this, of this function? I already showed it like twice. No, it's not an int. It's not an int. X is an int, but the function is not an int. Yeah, so I think somebody said, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it takes, yeah. it's, it takes a tuple of a single int and returns an int. So remember the operators in, for, for doing type checking on the Boolean, on the um, arithmetic expressions, the type is specified by, you know, a tuple of values in and some return type, at least in C. Yeah. What if it was void? If it was void? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you'd write. Other languages, different languages handle this differently. Um, yeah, I don't know formally what you would say. I know in like Scala, Scala is another functional language. They have this special unit type, which means nothing is returned. I'm not sure what Haskell does. Does Haskell even allow such things? They may have some special type. Not too familiar with it. Like, well, it, might ha it might have some special special type. They're also like, yeah, there's there's other, there's other different ways to do this in functional programming. You can have like a, I think they call it a sum C, type. Is, in C, sum. isn't void an actual type? Yeah, yeah, void, yeah, no, it's a type, it's a type, but, but it's a type that represents no value. So I think the way functional languages, one of the ways, I'm no expert on functional languages, but I think one of the ways that they handle it is they have this sum type. And so you can sort of case match whether there's a value or not a value. So the sum type can either be like empty or have a value. And that way you can still like do it in a type safe way. You can still, uh, you have to like explicitly check both cases every time you return the function. Uh, but void, it never returns anything. So I, I guess you can just make a special type for that. But yeah, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, you just need a special type. Okay, uh, good question. All right, so with functions, at least in simple C, we also have static scoping. So we didn't have this for control flow constructs. C, C has this, the current versions of C do allow local variables inside of while loops, uh, but simple C doesn't. Simple C allows local variables for functions though, however. And static scoping, as I, I kind of touched on this a little bit ago when we talked about compound statements, uh, but static scoping just defines the region of the code, the actual text of the code, the source code, the region of the code where that variable is valid, where that variable can be used. And I think you're all pretty much familiar with these, with these typing rules. If I define X in a parent scope, you know, outside of these curly braces, then I can use it inside of a nested scope unless I redefine it, unless I, you know, declare another X. So this X here, even though it has the same symbol, it's a different variable because it's defined locally to this function scope. I think you're all pretty much familiar with this, right? And so when I refer to X inside of the F function, because of these static scoping rules, you know, this is of course by design, this is not, you know, written in stone anywhere. By design, I use whatever is the most, whatever is the nearest declaration in my, uh, um, in my um, like chain of, of scopes. But that's just a rule. That's a rule in our language that we have these local variables and they refer to the nearest region of code where X was defined. And um, similarly, if I refer to Y, this will be a type error because Y was defined locally inside of F's scope. This is all review, right? You all, you all, any questions on this? Any questions on this? I think this is all pretty much review for you. Okay, so one way to, to think conceptually about what, what it means to execute a function or call a function is that we replace the function call with its result. Or in some sense, we replace it with the actual contents of the function. You can think of it as just sort of copying in the contents of that function and substituting all of the variables with the actual parameters that we pass to that function. So in this case, we had the square function before, which was just returned x times x. And so I just substitute in the body of that function 
replacing X with whatever the actual parameters were. And I think if you're taking the programming languages class, this should look familiar, right? Who's, who's taking the programming languages class? We talked about this. Yeah. yeah, this is like this is like the, you can show this with like the lambda calculus, and there are yeah, yeah, different ways. Yeah. Yeah, and then this this can be this can be evaluated as if as if the function weren't even there, and we get you know print eighty one. So that's just conceptually that's that's how we can think of function application. The problem is this concept of functions is is a conceit. It's a programming language conceit. There's no actual physical machine, I don't think, at least Intel doesn't, that can actually do this kind of function abstraction. You know, all we have is arithmetic operations, logical operations, moving around memory and registers, compare and branch, but you know, there's no defined function assembly instruction in, in the Intel world. So how can we so, so, you know, we're writing a compiler. We're not writing an interpreter. We're writing a compiler. We're translating source code into machine code. How can we implement a function and have all that behavior we want where, you know, you can call it and it'll freeze the state of the caller? How can we implement that just using this set of instructions that we have for, for our machine code? Did you have it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that, okay. Say, say again. Yeah, so that's, that's, how you can, that's how you can save the state. You can freeze the state of it. But even more simply, how can we even use the contents of that function? So that, yeah, we, we can use the stack and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. But how do we even like know where the code for that function is? You know, if, we're, if we have this program here where we're, where we're calling print square, what's this, what's this going to look like when we translate to LLVM? It's going to like try to do this expression, but what is that, what code is going to be generated there? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess that when it foresees the square function, it's going to basically declare like, like a branch name. A label, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then and then just fill in that. And then when we see that print square, it's just going to be an unconditional jump to that. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good way to go. So we can just do an unconditional branch to some other part of the code. I mean, maybe that's almost like too obvious, right? But that's like essentially what you're doing. You're just doing an unconditional branch to some other code that you've generated before at some point. And then certainly you use the stack in order to communicate between the, the, the caller and the callee. So this is exactly how we're going to implement this in hardware. We're going to use an unconditional branch to the code of a function. Note that you could also just copy the code of the function into the caller. You could do that as well. It's called inlining. But we're just going to generate the code separately and then branch to it. And in order to pass, in order to like um, handle all this substitution, you know, substituting the values, we're instead going to copy the parameters to well-known registers and memory locations. We're going to use the stack for that. And do the same thing with return value. So we just, you know, we have move, we have registers, we have memory. We can do that for passing values back and forth. And we have branch in order to execute some other piece of code that we define to be our function. So that's pretty much it. You know, it's nothing, nothing, nothing too, nothing too hard, right? It's pretty, pretty simple. So this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do functions in assembly. So let me see if I can show this kind of conceptually what this looks like. So let's take our, our program. Oops. Let's take our square function. Oops. And let's just print it. OK. So to make this really convenient for us, and remember this is going to be just some parse tree. We can still use this post order traversal strategy. So just like your classmate said, when we generate the code for this section here, for the body of our function, When we generate the code for this, we can just make a label 
So this is, this is pure assembly. So LLVM will be a little bit different. LLVM actually supports functions. But if we think about at the assembly level, we just make a label and put whatever the contents of this, well, not return. There's actually, oh, I forgot. Uh, that's why. There's no computation here. It's just returning the value. So it's going to take whatever the computation was here. You know, there's going to be some moves. There's going to be a call to multiply a couple of registers and so on. And it's going to end up being in some stored in some register, the result of this multiplication. Then I need to somehow, uh, I need to somehow branch, right? I need to somehow get back to the code where I was before. We can talk about that in a second. Okay, so that's generating the code for this function. And so now I just generate the code for my print statement as I did before. So I'm somehow going to have to branch, well, let me leave room for myself. So I'm somehow gonna branch to square. I somehow need to pass parameters here. I somehow need to recover the return value. And then I can finally call my print in my print function, which of course is going to be another, you know, it's going to be another um, branch because it's actually another function. So that, I mean, that's sort of conceptually just for the, when it comes to the branching behavior, this is all that's happening. You just generate the code somewhere else. We can just do it in, in top down order. This is, this is, um, Maybe one reason why you know C wants very things to be defined before they before they're used because you need to know something about that function. Uh, we generate it somewhere else, and then when we want to use it, we need to somehow pass parameters to it, do the unconditional branch so that we jump to square, execute it. Then we need a way to branch back to our function. So somehow this needs to branch somewhere. We need to figure out where to branch to. And then we need to somehow recover the return values. With me so far? Any, any questions on this? So as your as your classmate pointed out, we can use the stack to pass these pass these values. So let's do a quick little review of the stack. So remember, at least in Intel architectures, our, we have this address space. Zero is at the bottom, or the low addresses are at the bottom. The high addresses are at the top. The text, which is the, the actual code, the, the binary version of your code, global values. Then we have the heap, which is how, what you access with malloc and free. Then we have the stack. And the stack is the memory that's managed automatically by the compiler. So the way the stack works, just like you learned in you know, stacks in, in CS1, we push values onto the stack when we want to call a new function. So when we know we have a new function to call, we're going to push its parameters onto the stack and also push room for the return value onto the stack. I mean, conceptually. The actual Intel ABI does, some, does, does something more performant, which we'll see in a second. But conceptually, we can just think of pushing all the values we need for the parameters and for the return values onto the stack. So, so somehow, we need to push somehow we need oh why am I using the wrong color? Somehow we need to push our parameters onto the stack and pop them off and get the return value once we're done. Uh, yeah, so if you were to look at like the assembly code, although Intel has a special call instruction, but more or less, this is what you need to do in order to call a function. Okay, so so using a stack is a good idea because we like have access to it. But why do we need to use a stack? Why can't we just fix a location in memory, you know, say malloc, get a location in memory and just pass parameters that way? Why would we need to even use the stack for this? Like, what's the point? Why don't we just make a global variable and pass parameters that way? The order matters? Order of what? The order of the calls. Yeah, that's a good point. The order of the calls matters. So if we've got, say, 
um, say I've got a multiplication function for some reason. So if I've got a multiplication function, which does x times y for me, and my square function calls multiplication, and my main calls square, oops, Then exactly as your classmate said, if we have multiple nested calls, we need to save the state of all of the parent calls, all of the callers. So what does that look like in the stack? So I'm going to use the, the Intel conventional style here, where the bottom of the stack is at the top of the address space. So this is the, this is the bottom of stack bottom of the stack, but we're at the high address space here. So just if you're ever doing any like binary reversing or anything or using GDB, just remember that the stack grows downwards. You know, it's a, you subtract uh, addresses from the stack. Listen. Okay. So in main, we have whatever main local variables are. So this, well, okay, there are no local variables for main, so let's forget about that. So when main calls a function, uh, it pushes the parameter onto the stack and creates a space for the return value. So this is mains, well, okay, yeah. So it, it pushes the parameter onto the stack and saves a spot for the return value. So this set of information on the stack is called the stack frame or the activation record. Uh, so this is the stack frame for square. So main constructs this segment on the stack that stores all the values that square needs, both for its inputs and for its outputs. And now square has to also pass parameters. So it passes whatever X happens to be. So X is three at runtime and then pushes space for its return value. So this is the frame for uh, this is the frame for mult, and this is the frame for square. And then multiply has access to its. Oops, this should be x and y. Sorry. So uh, multiply has its parameters. They're both three. Does its computation, fills in its return value, and then when it's done computing, it branches back to wherever square was, removes these elements from the stack, and now we're back inside of the context for our square function. And that square function can you know, recover the return value, use it, use it for its return value. Uh, jump branch back to main, pop the values off, get the return value. And you know now we've now main has you know finished its computation. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I want to say about that? Does this make sense? Questions on this? So what if we've got a recursive function? Let's say we've got factorial. Sorry. Let's say we have factorial. What will the stack look like when we call factorial recursively? So let's say we call factorial three. 
So what happens when we call factorial three? What gets pushed onto the stack? We have, well, we have three. We have three. We have the parameter, oh, yeah, yeah, three. parameter to the first call of three and some space for the return value. So this is a simplification. This is not, this is a, I've, I've elided a bunch of information here actually, but conceptually we push the return value or push the parameters and space for the return value. Okay. Uh, but then what happens next? We're, we're now running, we're now inside of factorial. So if we run this, this X is not less than zero. So we move on to else. Then we return X times another call to factorial. So we're, we're in the middle of computing X times something. We're trying to compute factorial of X minus one. So what happens? Yeah, we just do the same process over again, just like it was called from main. So this is the stack frame for the first call to factorial. This is the stack frame for the second call to factorial. We go into the factorial function again, keep running, push the stack frame for the call to factorial where we pass it one, and finally push a stack frame for the call to factorial, which uh, passes zero. For the case where we pass zero, we hit this, we hit this base case, no more recursive calls. So the return value is one, then the return value is one times uh, one, which is one. Then the return value is one times two, which is two. Then the return value is two times three, which is six. Make sense? Make sense? So that's why I was like saying earlier, you can think of, you can think of recursion to make it like less confusing, instead of thinking about it as if it's calling itself, think about it as if it's calling a different function. Because like conceptually at runtime, you can think of each of these stack frames as like a different a function. It's actually, it's like a, a new instance of an object in, in object orientation. So each one of these stack frames represents a unique version of this function where the parameters, the parameters are different. Parameters have to be different. Okay, questions on this? So what about the, how do we know where we return from this function? So I sort of glossed over this, but when we, when we branch back from square, in this program, there's only one caller for square. But in our factorial program, there are two places where factorial is called. So we can't always branch back to the same place. So how do we know where to go back to when we're finished? So when we're, when we're finished calling this factorial, we need to branch back to this point where we're computing X times something. If we're in main and we call factorial, we need to jump back to main. So how do we know where to jump back to when we do one of these calls? Or how could we know? Yeah. Yeah, effect, I mean, that's a, intuitively, that's exactly right. So, yeah, exactly. So what that means is the label is the address of the location where you want to go back to. And it's not technically a parameter at that point, but yeah, we just push it onto the stack. And that's exactly how these, these functions are implemented in hardware. You push the address to return to onto the stack. It's actually the source of a whole bunch of security vulnerabilities as well, which we'll see in a couple of weeks. Because um, if you can blow away that address, you can control the program. But that's exactly right. So that return address also gets put onto the stack. I think it's called the um, it's called the dynamic link. If you read the if you read the Dragon Book, I think uh, the return address. If you use GDB, but that's exactly right. You just treat it as if it's one of the like it's one of the parameters, and then when we get to when we get to uh, this point in our code, we actually pull that address off of the stack and jump to it because we can branch you know you can branch you don't have to branch to a fixed value you can branch to whatever arbitrary address you want and so this branch gets filled in with one of the values on the stack yeah that's that's good really good questions on this questions on this so far so now you can go look at assembly code and and do some reverse engineering all right so we we did that okay 
So that was kind of con conceptual overview of how these how these functions actually you know conceptually what they do. You freeze it on the, you freeze the state on the stack, push a new stack frame for your call e, do all your ex jump branch to it, do all your execution. When you're done executing that function, pull the return address off the stack, jump to that return address pop everything off the stack that you made for that stack frame and voila you're back into your you've you know defrosted your your function that you were that you uh, the caller that was waiting for the callee to finish now actually doing this in hardware is a little bit more complicated so we need a convention for these for these function calls we have registers we have memory locations we have the order of parameters do they go in in order do they go in reverse order where does the return address go where's the return value go uh, and so there's actually a bunch of different conventions for this, depending on what hardware you have, even your operating system. These are all kind of dependent. That's one of the many reasons why, you know, Linux, a C program compiled for Linux won't, won't run in Windows. There are many reasons for that, but one of them is the calling convention. And so in Intel, like Linux uses uh, this thing called the System 5 AMD64 application binary interface. The application binary interface is just how functions communicate with each other. And so the way it works, it's a little bit more efficient than the stack. It'll pass the first six parameters as registers. So it's faster than, you know, copying stuff to memory. And it'll actually return the value in a specific register. Um, if the return value is, you know, bigger than, than a word size, that'll be, that'll be a problem. Uh, so for instance, I took it from, there's actually some really good web pages you can just look over for this. So if I've got this, this function that takes eight parameters, the first six parameters are going to be stored in registers before we call the function. The rest of them are going to be stored on the stack. The return address is next. Um, this is, oh yeah, so there, there's some other conventions about um, which registers need to be saved uh, when you do calling. So, uh, so that, that's the reason for that. And then you have your local parameters. So any local values are also pushed onto the stack. Okay, so I think, um, yeah, I think that's one minute. We can, we can, we can end it there. I'll just leave you with, uh, this, this, um, yeah, this is what it looks like when you when you decompile or when you compile uh, a function call. So here's the label. This return is an Intel special function for um, branching back to the original location. It'll actually pull the return address off the stack for you. Um, here is oh, where's the call? Where's the call to F? Okay. Anyway. So yeah, that, that's what the compiled code looks like. You have this label to F. And anyway, have a good Halloween. Have a good weekend. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>